Welcome everyone to our first video on the rate law. In this video, we'll be covering a few things. We'll introduce and understand the rate law equation. We'll identify the order of a reaction from the rate law and from a concentration versus time graph. And I will introduce the method of initial rates. What is the rate law? Well, it's a mathematical relationship between the rate of a chemical reaction and the concentration of the reactants. This is a relationship that unlike some other mathematical relationships, especially the ones that you may learn in physics, we must determine this experimentally for each unique chemical reaction. We cannot just look at a chemical equation in the stoichiometry of the equation and determine the rate law from that we must collect some experimental data and determine the rate law for that particular reaction. So if we have some reaction between reactant A and B, and the lowercase letters there would just be the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation, and it produces some products, the rate law equation would be the rate is equal to some constant K multiplied by the concentration of A raised to some exponent m multiplied by the concentration of b raised to some exponent n. So you'll note a few things about this equation. It turns out the rate of a chemical reaction does not depend on the products at all. It only depends on the concentrations of the reactants, and specifically the initial concentrations before we start the reaction. Note as well that the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation, lowercase a and lowercase b, do not appear in the rate law. So the rate of a chemical reaction is not directly associated always with the coefficients in the balanced chemical reaction or the stoichiometry of the reaction. So we have a few unknowns uh, here, right? We've got our concentrations of A and B. Those are just variables that we can measure. And then through carrying out a series of experiments, we can determine the value of K. And then we can determine what those numeric exponents actually are. We are going to eventually look at how to solve for the rate law. But it's also helpful to think about the rate law equation qualitatively and think about what it's telling us about the reaction, specifically how a change in concentration impacts the rate of a chemical reaction. Reaction order is a concept that is helpful in doing this. To determine the order of a chemical reaction, we look at the exponents. So for example, let's assume that we have a rate law where the rate is equal to some constant K multiplied by the concentration of A multiplied by the concentration of B squared. We would say that this reaction is first order with respect to A and second order with respect to B. So the order is the exponent and we want to talk, we can talk about the order with respect to an individual reactant and we can also talk about the overall order of the reaction. This would be a third order reaction. So before moving to the next slide, think about this question. Imagine if we did a few different trials of this reaction, and on each trial, we change the concentration of one of the reactants. So in one trial, we doubled the concentration of A, and in a different series of trials, we doubled the concentration of B. What impact do you think doubling the concentration of each of these reactants would have on the overall rate? So if we doubled the concentration of A but kept B the same, or if we doubled the concentration of B but kept A the same, would they have the same impact on the rate? Would it be different and how would it be different? Take a moment to think about that, even pause the video and try to work it out on paper before moving to the next slide. Okay, 
Let's now kind of answer that previous question by looking at a series of graphs. And let's just imagine we are looking at a reaction rate law here with only one, one reactant here. Okay, so just isolate one reactant. Here we have a first order reaction. The rate is equal to some constant multiplied by the concentration of A raised to the power of one. Well, what does a graph of this rate law look like? Well, the y-axis is going to be the rate. The x-axis is the initial concentration of reactant A. And what do we have here? Well, we have a y equals mx graph, something you've learned in math. Simple, straight line, linear relationship that goes through the origin. So what does this mean in terms of the impact of the concentration of A on the rate? Well, a linear relationship tells us that changing the concentration will change the rate proportionally. So if we double the concentration of A, the rate of reaction will double in response to that. If we increase the concentration by a factor of 20, the rate will increase by a factor of 20. It's a linear relationship when we have a first order reaction. A second order reaction looks like this. We see that we have a curve now that is just one half of a parabola. We have a y equals mx squared graph, and we're familiar with that from math class as well. So what does this mean in terms of the impact of concentration changes on the rate? Well, a quadratic relationship here tells us that if we double the concentration of A, the reaction rate will go up by a factor of four. If we triple the reaction, uh, the concentration of A, the reaction rate will go up by a factor of nine. So comparing our previous screen to this one, we can see that small changes in the concentration in a second order reaction have a larger impact on the reaction rate. The other basic uh, reaction order is a zero order reaction. So this is where the exponent turns out to be zero. What does that mean? Well, if the exponent on A is zero, the concentration of A raised to the exponent zero is always one, right? So that just means the rate is equal to the rate constant. Or if we were to graph that, we just have a horizontal line, meaning that the concentration changes in A have no impact on the rate of reaction. So you could double, triple, halve the concentration of A, and the rate is always going to stay the same. So how do we get the uh, how do we get the rate law equation? Well, there's a whole bunch of different methods. Sometimes it's just a matter of tracking the concentration changes over time um, for a whole bunch of series of reactions. Um, and that's very useful if you only have one reactant. If you can make use of differential or integral calculus, you, there's a whole other series of ways you can determine the rate law equation. But we don't have those tools at our hand and we can't always track changes in concentrations over the course of a reaction. So the method that we're going to use is incredibly useful and it's called the method of initial rates. So in this method, there's only two things we need to measure. We need to measure the instantaneous rate near the start of a chemical reaction. And we're gonna carry out a series of trials where we, the initial concentration of that reactant or reactants are varied. If we do have more than one reactant, We'll only change the concentration of one reactant at a time so we can look at, we can isolate that reactant and see its impact on the rate of reaction. So you might ask, well, how do we measure the instantaneous rate? Well, we can't, this is, method doesn't work for all reactions, but it works well for very quick reactions where we see a sudden change um, as soon as we start the reaction. And that will enable us to make a good estimate that the time it took for us to see a change is very close to the rate at the very start of the reaction. Let's look at this graphically. So here is a reaction, the decomposition of N2O5. 
Here is a graph of experimentally collected data. So this is a concentration versus time graph. The y-axis is concentration in moles per liter. And what we've done here is carried out five trials where we have different initial concentrations of N2O5. So at the bottom here, that would be a concentration of 0.01 moles per liter, then 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.06 and 0 0.08. So five trials, five different initial concentrations. And if we're able to measure that near the start, we can find the slope of the tangent right at the start of the reaction. And that will give us our initial rate in moles per liter per unit time, whatever that might be, likely seconds. So here is the data that we would collect through a series of five trials varying the initial concentration of some reactant. Okay, I've moved myself over here now uh, so that we can see these two graphs. So on the left here, I have that same graph that we saw on the previous screen, where we had the five trials and we saw the how the concentration changed versus time. So what are the two things we measured in this experiment? We measured the initial concentration of the five trials of this reactant. And then we calculated the instantaneous rate by measuring how long it took for the change to occur. From that, we have the slope of a tangent, which we know is the instantaneous rate of reaction. And so we take the information from the first graph and create the second graph where we now have on the y-axis, the initial rate of reaction. And then on the x-axis, we have the concentration. Those are our two variables in the rate law equation, rate versus concentration. So let's see where these red dots come from. So this first red dot at the bottom here, we see that is with a concentration of 0 0.02. So that would represent this trial on the left where the initial concentration is 0 0.02. And from the slope of this purple line, we would get the initial rate of, we would get the initial rate of reaction right there. So the height there is the initial rate, the x-axis there is our concentration. So here we've graphed those four, four of those five trials. And we can see when we, we, when we plot the rate versus initial concentration, in this case, they all fall on a straight line. And since they all fall on a straight line, what do we have? We have a linear relationship, or specifically, it's a first order reaction. If it's not a first order reaction, if it's some fractional exponent or um, a higher order reaction, it might be difficult to determine this uh, just by looking at it like we did here, but we could use, um, we could use spread, uh, a spreadsheet um, and graphing software to determine the equation of the line. Now at this point, it all seems pretty abstract. So what we want to do next is look at how we actually do this with some actual data. So in the following video, we're going to go through a tutorial on how to take some actual experimental data and figure out this rate law equation, uh, because once again, it's not always a first order equation where we can just graph this and we get a nice straight line. It might be second order or something in between. Um, and then we have to use some different mathematical tools to get to the rate law equation.